happy to welcome you to today's webinar. I am with the Great Plains Institute, and I am part of the Great Plains Institute uh, WRI project team that is helping to coordinate the Industrial Innovation Initiative. Um, just a, a couple of housekeeping notes before we get fully underway here. We are uh, recording this webinar so we can share uh, with those who weren't able to attend today. And we'll also share a recording uh, with all of you in case there's anything you want to go back and review. And um, we will be managing uh, questions throughout the webinar via the chat function, the chat box, chat box function, and also using that same mechanism for questions and answers uh, towards the end of the webinar. Just a, a quick overview um, of, of the agenda today. So the focus of this webinar is on the priority economic recovery recommendations that have been developed so far through I3. Um, in addition to uh, the overview of the recommendations, we'll have a congressional perspective and also some I3 participant perspectives. And as I mentioned before, an opportunity for questions and answers um, at the end of the webinar. A little context setting and, uh, you know, the, this information probably is not a great surprise to, to any of you, um, but certainly the COVID pandemic has put economic recovery and jobs uh, front and center and the industrial sector is facing many challenges, um, you know, including a decline in demand and, and a decrease in, in business and consumer confidence. And so it is certainly clear that we need to continue to look for ways to stimulate economic activity and restore market demand to keep and create high wage jobs. And, and, uh, and that's certainly something that I3 is very focused on. Um, some additional context setting, uh, industry, it represents the largest source of US emissions when you consider the full scope of, of direct and indirect emissions. And globally, carbon emissions come from, uh, a third of carbon emissions come from industrial sectors. And so if you drill down a little bit further, over half of, of these industrial emissions occur in, in the sectors of steel, cement, and basic chemicals. And more than half of those emissions from those three sectors are generated through industrial processes. And those emissions um, can't be mitigated through efficiency or other um, decarbonization efforts um, of energy inputs. And so we need new solutions. So a brief overview of I3 and what that is all about. Um, I3 brings together key industry uh, representatives with state officials and, and stakeholders to answer questions and identify opportunities um, in the realm of industrial decarbonization. And as we'll be talking about today, I3 participants have already worked together to develop some consensus recommendations to Congress um, in the economic recovery context. And in the coming months, uh, we'll be working together to continue advocating for smart policies, both at the federal and state levels and educating policymakers and additional stakeholders. Longer term, the group is gonna dig in deeper to understand and advocate for additional solution sets, including identifying adoption barriers and, and other issues that may arise, all in, in the hope of achieving industrial decarbonization. And so we plan to use uh, multiple analytical tools and uh, work with experts uh, both here in the US and around the world to better understand what the mix of solutions could be um, and, and hopefully uh, work in the industrial sector to achieve decarbonization cost effectively by mid-century. So this slide shows um, the impressive mix of participating entities in I3, and you can see all the logos on screen, but industry, uh, state representation, uh, uh, nonprofit organizations are all at the table, and that's really, really exciting to see, and we're so glad that several of our participants are with us today, and they'll also be sharing some perspectives. So with that backdrop, it is my pleasure to introduce our first speaker today, and that is Abigail Rajitsky, and she is a professional staff member for the House Select Committee on the Climate Crisis. And Abigail previously was a Congressional Science Fellow uh, working on energy and environmental issues for Senator Tina Smith of Minnesota, and we are thrilled to have Abigail with us today to share 
her perspective. And so Abigail, let me make sure you're unmuted here. There you go. I think you should be live. Thanks for being with us today, Abigail. <laughs> thanks, Patrice. Yes, thank you. Um, and thanks uh, to I3 for um, inviting me to speak a little bit um, on our recommendations. So as Patrice said, I'm Abigail Rajitsky, a professional staff member on the House Select Committee on the Climate Crisis. Um, and decarbonizing the industrial sector was one of the pieces of um, the report that I focused on. Um, so I'm happy to be with all of you today. Um, so I'll go through a quick overview um, of what of some of our recommendations, along with some of the things that are moving forward in Congress in this space. Um, so one of the things that we looked at in the select committee was really some key technologies um, that through our stakeholder process, we realized were going to be important for decarbonizing the industrial sector. So some of those are in, uh, energy efficiency, electrification and fuel switching to lower carbon fuels. Um, carbon capture, utilization, and storage, as well as uh, green and blue hydrogen and moving towards a circular economy framework. Um, so with those kind of big buckets of technologies, they kind of percolate throughout our policy recommendations. And then for the policy recommendations themselves, we have um, kind of four different areas that uh, we focus in on. The first being innovation and commercialization. So. Um, there's still a lot of development to be done on the technology side. We recognize that for the industrial sector. So this is a really important piece here. So some of the things that um, we recommend in our policies are looking at those key technology areas that I mentioned previously and making sure that we're supporting R&D um, as well as demonstration um, and deployment of all of those key areas across different um, industrial subsectors and making sure that the Department of Energy where a lot of this research um, and funding is being done, has the proper support um, and organization to really uh, enable this uh, technology development. Um, we're excited that um, some legislation is already happening in this space. For example, the Clean Indus Industrial Technologies Act um, from our select committee member, um, Sean Kasten, um, as well as going through the House uh, Science Committee um, that we work with closely. Um, so that we know is a key bill and is part of our recommendations. Um, also looking at uh, kind of innovation and commercialization more broadly, like expanding and reforming the DOE Title 17 Loan Guarantee Program. Um, and I think another great thing is a lot of our recommendations are also reflected in the I3 recommendations. Um, so it's great that we're kind of all coming to similar, uh, similar conclusions. Um, and another uh, exciting thing that's going to be happening uh, on the House is we have um, the Energy and Commerce Committee and the Science Committee have put together a fairly large energy package um, that was introduced this week, um, will be coming to the floor next week, and that contains um, many of our recommendations um, from our report on the energy um, innovation side, um, including um, the CETA bill, um, including things like um, the DOE um, Combined Heat Power Technical Assistance Centers, um, and other supports for um, this sector. So um, we're excited to see many of our recommendations reflected in the energy package. Um, and the Senate has its own uh, energy package that was introduced a while ago there. And so we're, we're hopeful that um, there can be some movement on, in both chambers on this front. So beyond uh, innovation and commercialization, the next kind of policy bucket that we have is financial support. So that's anything ranging from uh, revolving loan funds um, to tax credits to other ways to enable financing and uh, kind of public private partnerships on the tax credit side. Um, that's you know, a range of tax credits from CHP and WHP um, tax credits and continuing those um, for industrial facilities. Um, the 45Q tax credit for CCUS and making sure that it's more effective for um, industrial specifically as well as utilization. Um, a new tax credit potentially for low emission hydrogen as well as manufacturing tax credits like the 48C uh, manufacturing tax credit and thinking about uh, revamping the 45M production tax credit for maybe beyond energy efficiency uh, appliances and maybe some more um, a broader set of decarbonization technology components. Uh, the next bucket that we think about is uh, physical and, and knowledge infrastructure. And in here, I'd like to give a, a shout out to uh, Neil from ACEEE, who I think is also on the call on 
uh, thinking about this knowledge infrastructure piece. Um, so on the physical infrastructure side, these are things like um, infrastructure for materials recovery and recycling. That's part of the circular economy framework that we'd like to push towards um, things like large um, scale carbon storage to really enable um, carbon capture on these industrial facilities, um, as well as thinking about hubs for uh, low and zero emission hydrogen to really get that industry started here. On the knowledge infrastructure side, um, we think of these in kind of two ways. One, thinking about the type of data that we'll need um, to enable this transformation, um, being able to understand um, the, the inputs and uh, the emissions intensities of different processes that are going into creating our industrial materials um, and being able to really know uh, what those emissions intensities are, um, what those processes are, what the supply chain is, um, so that we can kind of compare between different, um, different materials and make sure that we're you know, supporting um, the technologies that we need to support to ensure we can continue reducing um, these emissions. And so there's a piece of the Energy and Commerce Clean Future Act that starts to think about this, looking at environmental product declarations and um, really building out our capabilities of getting this type of data in a way that's usable um, for the government or for other consumers of these types of products. Then the other piece of um, knowledge infrastructure that we know is really important is thinking about the workforce. Um, and so as we're thinking about different types of workforce development programs, especially um, when we're thinking about how to support um, communities that maybe have been um, underinvested in or going through economic transition, how we can make sure to support the workers in those communities in ways that we know um, that industry in the types of skills that industry is going to need and making sure to make those connections. Then our last uh, bucket of policies is um, markets and standards. So really trying to build the market for lower carbon products. So one of the key um, pieces here we're thinking about is a buy clean program. So for federal procurement of lower emission um, products. And here the Energy and Commerce Committee has also included this type of provision in their Clean Future Act discussion draft. And so we're working closely with them on trying to bring this forward um, and thinking through um, kind of the implementation and further details of what this program might look like. Um, so that's an area that um, we're certainly interested in getting more stakeholder input on. Then um, beyond government procurement, we're also thinking about um, tradable performance emission-based standards um, for industrial products and um, coupling these with border adjustment mechanisms because we know um, while we are trying to get uh, emissions reductions within our industries here, we don't want that to lead to things like factory closures and offshoring. You know, what we wanna do is be able to help our industries build better, um, reduce their emissions and really become more successful because from doing that. Um, and so we, we understand that it's gonna be really important to have some kind of mechanism to ensure that um, those industries um, have some protection, especially the EITE industries. And lastly, we, we think about uh, additional standards for things like um, industrial efficiency, both equipment processes and system-wide, um, low emissions heat to really try to push um, the envelope there, as well as, um, again, standards for increasing materials recirculation and efficiency um, and continuing to push on the circular economy front. So those are the, the kind of main buckets that we, we thought about in the report. Um, and I shared kind of along the way some of the movement that's going on on the Hill. Um, I, I should also mention uh, on the Senate side, um, the uh, Senate Democrat Special Committee on the Climate Crisis also put out their own report um, with, uh, with a good industrial section as well. Uh, many of our recommendations um, match and are very complementary. And so I know this is something that they're thinking about um, as well. So with that, I think I'll, I'll go ahead and turn it back over so uh, you can get really deep into the I3 recommendation. Great. Thank you, Thank Abigail. You. Go ahead, Patrice. Over to you, Nicholas. Okay. Great. Um, thank you both. Uh, so for those of you that don't know me, my name is Nicholas Bianco. I serve as the Deputy Director for WRIUS, helping to oversee WRI's program of work in the United States. 
I'm gonna walk quickly through the group's recommendations before turning it over to several of the participants themselves to provide some of their own context and um, perspectives. So one key distinction that I'm gonna draw right now between what I laid out and what you heard from Abigail is this group right now has released um, stimulus-oriented recommendations that are really focused on near-term economic and jobs benefits. We will, in the coming months, be turning to a longer process to flesh out a wider range of policies that speak to some of the things that you heard from Abigail. Um, but for now, this piece is really stimulus-oriented. And so you'll see the recommendations that we're gonna walk through try to meet these five criteria uh, that you see on this slide as a result. Um, so one, providing near-term economic and jobs benefits. Uh, and therefore relying on existing legislative authorities where possible, avoiding or minimizing the need for further rulemaking or guidance procedures, and also supporting long-term industrial decarbonization and, and hopefully having the potential for broad um, political support. So if you move to the next slide, you'll see the full list of recommendations. They span the suite of technology deployment from support for mature technologies to first of the kind as well as support for R, D, and D so we can build the technologies of tomorrow. I'm not gonna read through this whole list because that's what I'm gonna do in the, in, the in the coming slides. But one thing I will say right now is if you haven't already, please do type in this web address you see at the bottom of the screen and you can um, pull up the full set of recommendations and the full, um, the full case for why um, the group felt that they would be helpful. Um, but I'll, I'll do my best to, to, do, to do the group's uh, work justice um, as we move forward. So next slide. So the first one here is direct pay for industrial tax credits. Um, so, and, and here you can see in, in yellow, the specific provisions of the tax code that can help support industrial decarbonization, including 45Q for CCUS, 45, section 45 renewable production and 48, um, ITC for a variety of types of projects. The, the basic rationale for this though is that the current system just isn't designed all that well and a significant portion of tax credit value is lost to the many transaction costs of equity finance. Um, these costs can be particularly high for emerging less commercialized technologies and moving to a direct pay at least for uh, the near term would help reduce the complexity of those transactions supporting investment reducing ultimately costs to taxpayers as well and it's particularly valuable in today's environment where markets are more severely constrained as a result of COVID-19. Next slide. The, the next recommendation was to eliminate eligibility capture thresholds for industrial projects under 45Q. So um, as many of you know, 45Q provides tax credits for carbon capture storage and utilization. But under the law today, industrial facilities must sequester at least 100,000 metric tons of CO2 per year, and utilization projects must sequester at least 25,000 metric tons per year. And as far as the group can tell, these thresholds serve no real discernible public policy purpose, but do significantly constrain the deployment of CCUS technologies in the industrial sector. And so there'd be significant benefit to removing them for industrial projects, helping a whole suite of new projects move forward. In the Midwest and Gulf states alone, eliminating the 100,000 ton threshold will result in an additional 1,470 facilities being eligible for 45Q. And eliminating the 25,000 ton threshold for utilization would expand opportunities to advance first of a kind and early stage demonstration projects for a range of projects as well. Next slide. The third recommendation was to expand USDOE cost share programs, feed studies, and support saline storage. As a general matter, there's the group felt that there's just not enough federal policy support for first through fifth of a kind commercial demonstration, leaving too many emerging technologies caught in the valley of death. And so greater technology demonstration cost share would help drive the development of new and innovative projects while simultaneously proving out long-term commercial pathways to decarbonization. Feed studies you see here is the second bullet in yellow. They're often overlooked but critical. They provide the third party validation of project costs, which is required to receive financing. Yet unfortunately, these studies are among the most challenging components of a project to pay for. And so federal funding to support this would provide a valuable boost to innovative new projects. And then finally, you see here in the third bullet in yellow, federal support for establishment of CO2 transport and geologic storage hubs, which would really help catalyze development in a broader commercial carbon capture industry. Uh, if you move to the next slide, you'll see 
um, our um, next recommendation, recommendation number four, which um, is removing barriers to DOE Title 17 loan guarantee program. So for those of you not familiar with Title 17, it aims to mitigate financing risks for first-of-a-kind projects by providing loan guarantees for up to 80% of project costs which can be very valuable for these, er for these early projects. Unfortunately, there's multiple structure barriers that discourage utilization of the program, including high application fees, third-party advisor fees, credit subsidy costs, restrictive eligibility requirements. Congress could help re-energize the program and stimulate development by providing financial support to reduce various application-related fees, enabling more projects to access funding by allowing federal grants to count towards equity contributions, allowing projects to receive DOE loans and federal grants, allowing state financing entities to access the program, and eliminating some of the restrictions that exist today around CCS projects. And then importantly for the group, you'll see the third uh, bullet in yellow, which is if Title 17 is actually going to support the full range of industrial decarbonization technologies, and not just a few of them, then it's helpful, it would be very helpful for Congress to revise the program's eligibility criteria clarify that all of these applications should be eligible to access the loan guarantee program and not just some of them. The next slide, uh, renew and expand 48C Advanced Manufacturing Tax Credit Program. Uh, this program was originally created under the American Recovery and Reinvestment Act of 2009 to foster investment in job creation and clean energy. Establish a tax credit for 30% of the tap capital expenditures for eligible investments. It was very successful, but it's in sunset reviving it and importantly expanding eligibility to include investments in low carbon industrial technologies and processes could help spur valuable job boosting investment in innovative decarbonization technologies in the industrial sector. Next slide. We have uh, enhanced technical assistance through DOE's Better Buildings, Better Plants initiative. So this is a program that provides technical assistance and voluntary leadership platforms to help industry overcome hurdles associated with deployment of new technology. The group identified three changes that would broaden participation, increase the scope of industrial improvement supported, and help ensure that insights grant uh, gained by large plants can inform the efforts by smaller plants. And those include one, identifying sector specific goals that define leadership by industry, instead of relying on a one size fits all approach. Two, developing metrics with industry partners for tracking and goal setting that go beyond energy efficiency to cover the full range of decarbonization activities that can be undertaken. And three, track participation within the program of the 500 largest manufacturing plants and include increased linkages with the Sesame Smart Manufacturing Profiles. Uh, move on to recommendation seven, which is block grant funding for state industrial decarbonization programs. Uh, another place we can, where we can point to the American Recovery and Reinvestment Act of 2009, which helped stimulate economic activity by providing states with block grant funding to support energy efficiency and renewables. A similar approach could be used um, today for, for industry and to help support investment in efficiency and other measures that help reduce emissions at industrial facilities and improve competitiveness while building jobs. The group thought that it would be useful to provide, um, to consider providing additional funding as well to states that establish programs that help build market demand for low carbon pro projects. Um, and you know, those could take a wide range of different forms, everything from a buy clean type program or something else altogether. And then finally, the eighth recommendation and final one that I will walk through today is expanding federal investment in R D and D for industrial decarbonization technologies. So, and here at the top in yellow, you can see that we've identified some of the broad categories of technologies that warrant more attention. Um, and I think everyone on the line today probably can appreciate the incredibly valuable role that federal R&D and has played in driving innovation for clean energy. And I think the, as we talk to the participants in I3, there was a sense that there'd be tremendous value to putting that same intensity of focus into industrial sectors and technologies. Doing so would help ensure that the country is, is positioned to maintain and grow industrial job base as we transition to a low carbon future. So let me stop there, turn things over to, to Patrice and, and Brad, and you'll have a chance to hear from our participants themselves. Thank you. <clears throat> great, thank you, Nicholas. Really appreciate that great overview. Um, my name is Brad Crabtree. I'm Vice President for Carbon Management at the Great Plains Institute and part of the <clears throat> staff team 
for I3. And uh, I have a terrific group of panelists joining us from the project today. And what I'm going to do is just very briefly introduce all of them together, and then they'll each provide a brief set of remarks, and then we'll have some um, Q&A uh, to conclude. So, you know, within I3, we're very fortunate. We have a combination of, of leading uh, technology companies in the startup space, uh, as well as some of the leading industrial uh, companies in the world. And uh, Bo Boylan, who's Chief Commercial Officer at Solidia, represents one of the technology development companies. Uh, he's responsible for commercialization of Solidia's technologies. He also has a broad background in startup ventures. And so it's going to be really great to hear from, from one of the leading companies in this space. Kind of at the other end of the spectrum, we have uh, Dow Chemical, which is um, one of the very largest chemical companies in the world. Uh, Gloria Gamar Mendez uh, is the public policy leader uh, for energy and climate change issues at Dow. <clears throat> She's a chemical engineer. Uh, she works to support Dow's long-term view of carbon, helping to develop and implement strategies to mitigate risk and capture additional value for Dow through decarbonization. Um, we also have some of the leading NGOs working in the decarbon industrial decarbonization arena. Uh, we're fortunate to have uh, Matt Bright, who's a policy advisor at Third Way, uh, with us today. Matt's an environmental scientist responsible for industrial decarbonization and carbon capture use and storage at Third Way. Uh, prior to Third Way, Matt was a AAAS fellow uh, in the office of Illinois Representative Sherry Bustos. Uh, we, number of us, worked with him, uh, and he played a really significant role shepherding the development of the first ever congressional bill for federal financing of CO2 transport infrastructure. Um, in addition to the industrial companies themselves, we also have leading power companies that have a lot of industrial customers in their service territories. One of those significant players is Entergy. Uh, Rick Johnson is Director of Sustainability at Entergy. Um, he has been very active as a proponent for utility engagement with key industries to help them reduce their carbon footprint. I'd like to note that, that uh, Rick's advocacy for the importance of engaging in the industrial realm was a, was a big contribution to getting I3 off the ground as a project. Uh, and last but not least, we have uh, another one of our NGOs, in this case, Third Way, which is the, I'm sorry, <laughs> Nature Conservancy, which is the largest conservation group in the world. Uh, Anna Dirkschwager is the Climate and Energy Policy Advisor for the Midwest Division of the Nature Conservancy. Um, she is very, very actively engaged in her role with industries and other stakeholders across the region to support efforts to reduce carbon emissions as part of the broader climate program. Uh, Prior to TNC, it was our great fortune to have Anna as a colleague at the Great Plains Institute. And before that, she was in state government in Minnesota with the uh, Department of Natural Resources. So we're really glad to have everybody. We're going to jump right in, uh, in the interest of time, and start off with Bo. I'll turn it over to you, Bo. Thank you. Great. Thanks, Thanks Brad. Uh, uh, Lydia is really excited to be part of, of this conversation. Uh, as Brad mentioned in the introduction, Solidia is a, uh, a startup, and to use one of Nicholas's uh, terms, a first of its kind or first of a kind technology that's navigating its way through the various stages of, of commercialization. So uh, I would suggest we really represent a real live example of the very types of innovative technologies and representative of those that uh, are making this journey with us that are gonna be directly impacted directly impacted and immediately impacted by the recommendations uh, of, of I3. So we're thrilled to be here. We, um, Solidia participates in the industrial sector part of the conversation, and then more specifically um, in cement. So Solidia is a technology that uh, uh, really is two pieces. Uh, the first part of the technology uh, enables cement producers to produce a low carbon, low energy, non-hydraulic cement. The second part of the conversation uh, is a technology that enables concrete producers to take waste stream CO2 and actually cure the concrete with CO2. So for those of you who were like me when you got in this business and didn't really understand the difference between cement and concrete, just in case there are some, 
Uh, concrete is uh, all around us. It's the road you drive on. It's the sidewalk you walk on. It's the floor and foundation in your home. Uh, cement is the glue or the binder that holds all that concrete together. So uh, just a, a real quick, uh, a very elementary um, distinction between, between the two. So back on the cement side, as Patrice mentioned in her introductory comments in the industrial sector, you know, cement is, um, uh, and you know, cement is often cast as the villain in this conversation. And I think that's unfortunate because we, we, um, we have the pleasure of working with some of the world's largest cement companies and they're doing some great work. Um, they understand the impact of the missions that they have and, and they're doing some, some great work. Um, but on the cement side, uh, Solidity enables the existing cement producers utilizing their existing plant and equipment, utilizing their existing raw material, uh, uh, raw, raw meal feed, uh, basically their existing supply chain to reduce their CO2 emissions by 30%, 30 to 40%, depending on uh, conditions and the kiln. Uh, and they also see a, a subsequent reduction of energy usage of about 30% as well. So you, you have a nice balance there of both CO2 emissions and, and energy reduction. And through that energy reduction, the other tie-in we have to this conversation is uh, because the kilns are able to operate at lower temperatures, this affords the cement producers the opportunity to consider alternate fuels that are not currently available to them um, by way of, of uh, the current production processes with, with Portland cement. So I think uh, um, many of us are, are very aware of, of, of the emissions um, conversations, the challenges and the advancements that are being made in the cement industry. What's less talked about or less known, and this is why we are very supportive um, of all of the recommendations of I3, but in particular, a few of them, is the concrete side. Um, I think Abigail talked about CCUS, uh, this is the U I'm referring to. This is the utilization of CO2. Uh, and that's where Solidity and other emerging technologies are really, 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 we think going to have a pretty profound impact on, on the carbon mitigation uh, conversation. So on the concrete side, uh, you now have this low carbon, low energy, non-hydraulic cement. That cement then goes into the concrete production and supply chain. And you end up having uh, concrete that is cured fully with CO2, not with water. Uh, with uh, great product benefits, good mechanical, chemical, physical properties, uh, good cost advantages, uh, which is terrific when you're an emerging technology um, in, in, in terms of the production and ultimately uh, the supply chain. So ultimately what we, what we end up with is again, a, a raw material feed into the concrete industry that uh, really is contributing to carbon emissions reduction and smart energy usage that's then fed into a, a concrete production uh, and supply chain and use that then takes away stream uh, CO2 and enables it for good. Um, oftentimes, uh, we'll, hear, we'll hear of this emerging category of utilization technologies as, uh, as carbon tech. I know, I know Matt and his group at Third Way have spent a lot of time on that, that category or grouping of technologies that are not just cement-based, they're in plastics and, and some other industries. So uh, we're, we're thrilled to be part of the conversation. Again, we're we're a live uh, representation of, of, of companies that are, are navigating this very, very uh, difficult, challenging process of commercially, uh, commercializing innovation. I think I heard Nicholas say this, I wrote it down, uh, a phrase called the valley of death. Uh, Nicholas, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think you said that. And that is a very real, uh, that is a very real term to um, emerging innovation um, where they get to the point where they've advanced the technology from a capability perspective but really are in dire need of the kind of support that the I3 recommendations provide. Uh, in our case, as a technology uh, company, how that enables ultimately those who participate in our uh, technology on the cement and, and the concrete side. So very, very pleased to be part of this and uh, uh, really honored to be part of it. And uh, again, for us, this is, uh, this is everyday uh, reality for us and the, the kind of uh, recommendations here have direct immediate impact on our ability to get these innovations uh, into market quickly. Great, uh, thank you so much, Bo, really appreciate it. Um, now we'll turn to Gloria Mar. At Dow. Gloria Mar? Yes, hi, can you hear me? Yes, very good, thank you. Perfect. Thank you for the opportunity to be part of this panel today. At Dow, we aspire to become 
the most innovative, customer-centric, inclusive, and sustainable material science company in the world. To achieve that, we are seeking for solutions to the energy and climate change challenges together with key participants collaboratively. The CEO Climate Dialogue is a clear example of this effort. We have been sponsors for more than 10 years of MIT's joint program on the science and policy of global change. And as members of the Business Roundtable, we support the release they made this week of their climate change policy and principles. We were very pleased to be invited taking part of the Industrial Innovative Initiative Project, where we also believe that the recommendations could bring a very positive impact. These suggestions could easily have bipartisan support and will assist during the economic recovery from the impacts of COVID-19 on key industrial sectors of the United States. We all have to come back from this delicate situation stronger, better, and perhaps more importantly, aware and very well prepared for the challenges occurring from climate change. We're confident that these recommendations not only will help uh, reducing emissions for the long run, but also create high wage jobs for today and for tomorrow with technology, leadership, and economic competitiveness. First, it is key eliminating or reducing as much as possible the 45Q threshold eligibility for industrial facilities for CCUS projects. There are various industrial processes with low concentrations of CO2, and they will need CCS, CCUS, to be able to operate in a decarbonized economy, or in other words, on a 2050 climate neutral world. Under the current 45Q conditions, numerous industries are left out of the possibility to use the tax incentive. The threshold discourages technology, innovation, and emissions reductions. We also believe that 45Q falls short, falls short on the incentive that it provides as CCS US projects, because um, as you know, require billions of dollars to be implemented. We all know that due to COVID-19, several projects were delayed or seriously affected. And it would be necessary and urgent to an, an, an urgent step to expand 45Q's current window for projects. In similar lines, to place America in a leadership position towards mitigation, it would be great to revive the expired 48C Advanced Manufacturing Tax Credit Program. Also, expanding 48C to include facilities that, that manufacture industrial goods for new product, with new production processes that produce emissions well below current best practices and expanding 48C to allow low carbon transportation fuels, include fuels from CCUS and materials from waste-based sources, from waste-based sources. At Dow, we're currently developing new processes that will reduce emissions significantly compared to legacy petrochemical processes, as well as circularity for plastics waste management, using them as fuel or as feedstocks. The tax incentive from 48C will accelerate implementations of such projects. The current economic environment provides extra obstacles for projects to secure tax equity investments. Switching the tax incentives to direct pay offers certainty, protection, and a lifeline that prevents projects from not being implemented today or canceled. In addition, the direct payment option would offer transparency and equally important, security. For the government, allowing direct payment option is transparent. These projects are jobs today. And we should, and we should remember that this is the way of keeping the economy going. Lastly, but not least, I would like to highlight the initiatives that are aimed to stimulate research, development, and pre-commercial or commercial scale demonstration. As we just heard, um, these innovative technologies are key for reducing industrial carbon emissions. Dow team believes 
that the industrial innovate, innovation and in, initiative was a greatly rewarding experience and we were very pleased to be part of this project. Thank you. And please don't hesitate addressing whatever questions you may have. Thank you. Back to you, Brad. I can keep going, Brad, but I you... think it's time for Matt. Sí. For Brad. It is. I Brad, so Matt, I, I can, are you, with, are you on, Matt? Yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm here. Can you hear me? Yes. All right, great. Go ahead, thank you. <clears throat> Perfect. Well, thank you. Uh, thank you very much to the I3 initiative for having us here, Brad, uh, Patrice, for facilitating. Um, it's great to be here. My name is Matt. I am the Industrial Decarbonization Policy Advisor for Third Way. So uh, my job is to try to get policies to lower that 22 to 29 percent of emissions, U.S. emissions is coming from that sector. Um, love being on this panel. Uh, thanks very much to uh, Solidia Dow for just speaking. Um, I'm going to dovetail a little bit on uh, what Gloria Amar um, said, and uh, because we we love really all of the policies at Third Way, um, but I want to zoom out just a little bit and give give a little bit of perspective about why um, members of Congress senators should be interested in these policies right now. Um, so since uh, you know February to April with COVID, um, we lost 1.4 million manufacturing jobs. Um, we've subsequently clawed back a lot of those jobs, but just looked at the Bureau of Labor Statistics report that came out on September 4th, manufacturing jobs are still down uh, 727,000. Um, since February. So we are looking at significant job losses. Um, that's, this is a big problem. And, you know, third way, when we look at these policies, um, we are excited by them. We're excited because climate change and industry, it's, this is a tangible merging a meeting of um, rebuilding the world. So Thomas Paine, you know, going all the way back to 1776, he talked about the birthday of a new world. That's what he called the United States. And when we're thinking about rebuilding the world um, to, you know, to be able to combat climate change, to be able to deal with all these problems, um, we are talking about, um, you know, exactly what Thomas Paine said, which is that we have it in our power to rebuild, to build the world over again. Um, and, and that's the way we feel about these. So industry is going to build the materials that, um, that we need to combat climate change. And when you look at jobs in the manufacturing spe sector specifically, uh, you know, manufacturing jobs, these are $69,000 jobs. Um, when you look at steel specifically, 92,000. So if we build cleanly, um, and we are going to be building, you know, they say that the world's gonna be adding a new New York City essentially every month for the next 40 years. That's what we're looking at globally building. If we build with low carbon materials, if we build smartly, um, we have a real opportunity uh, to, to combat climate change in the industrial sector. So, um, and these are, you know, these are good jobs that are spread across the United States. So we are very interested in the 48C manufacturing tax credit. We think this is hugely, hugely important. Um, as Nicholas talked about, this was started under ARA. Um, it's a 30% investment tax credit to, uh, you know, to manufacturing facilities that are establishing, expanding, re-equipping uh, facilities to produce, um, you know, advanced energy properties. Uh, these are solar, wind, CCUS equipment, carbon, that's carbon capture, uh, utilization of storage equipment. Um, you know, biorefinery equipment. Um, under R, this was a very successful program. So there were $2.3 billion that were allocated to these 48C tax credits under ARA. Um, that 
though that amount of money that 2.3 billion dollars supported investments at 183 manufacturing facilities in 43 states so if you're wondering you know does this really apply to me do these policies apply to me we're talking about 43 states here that 40 48 c affected um, that 48 c tax credit was oversubscribed by more than three to one so this was highly successful it could be highly successful again um, you know, we think that that's, it's very, very important to bring this back. Um, and and as, as Nicholas mentioned, you know, the fact that these program, that this program can be stood up quickly, all of these policies, that's hugely, hugely important. Um, so, you know, we think that within six months, this could be working again. IRS knows how to do it. DOE knows how to do it. Um, so let's get it done. Uh, as, as Gloria Amar talked about, the 100,000 ton uh, capture threshold, removing that, um, and the, the 25,000 uh, ton capture threshold for carbon utilization projects, we think that that's very important. Um, the work that I3's done found that, you know, 1,470 industrial facilities would be eligible for the 45Q tax credit incentive if we r remove that threshold. So again, you know, 1,470 industrial facilities, that's gonna affect many, many um, members of Congress and senators. Uh, lastly, just like to mention the demonstrations, uh, feed studies, innovation. Um, you know, David Roberts came out with a good box article um, talking about innovation the other day. Uh, you know, these demonstrations, getting projects through the valley of death, you build it, they'll come, we need to build more of these facilities, we learn how to do it, and the costs go down. So, uh, you know, thinking specifically, we're very interested in direct air capture. How about if we build the entire industry um, surrounding, you know, building a lot of direct air capture facilities, but you build a big direct air capture facility, you're talking about 3,500 jobs. And, uh, you know, we were very interested in the Rhodium Group produced a, a um, paper about if we build out a DAC industry in the next 30 years, we're talking about 300,000 jobs. So demonstrations are critical to really sparking an industry like direct air capture and getting it up to a really commercially viable industry. So demonstrations are gonna be really, really critical to get a lot of these bench scale and, and a little bit farther down on the TR le or TRL levels uh, up to full commercial scale. So again, you know, we love all these policies, we'd love to be able to talk about all of them, but just, I think the framing is really important that industry is something that you can take to your constituents and, and they can get a vision for climate change is, is the factory. You know, they're doing work to combat climate change. It's not just installing, installing a solar panel and wind, uh, which is great, but it's also, you know, remaking the world. So that's great. And uh, I will pass it back to Patrice. Thanks, Matt. And next is Rick Johnson with Entergy. Rick, I think I have you unmuted. I think so. Good morning, uh, everybody. Thanks for uh, having me, and, and I appreciate I3 setting the session up about these important recommendations. Um, does anybody out there, uh, does anybody out there use electricity? Yeah, I think we all know what Entergy makes and, and distributes uh, to our customers. We have 2.9 million customers uh, throughout parts of Arkansas, Louisiana, uh, Mississippi and Tech in Southeast Texas. Um, and uh, speaking of Louisiana, you know, in our in one of the opening slides, Patrice mentioned that about a third of global carbon emissions come from the industrial sector. Well, in Louisiana, uh, that's a little bit different, as you can imagine. Uh, the concentration of industrial um, uh, operations along the Gulf Coast in South Louisiana and Southeast Texas uh, is pretty uh, pretty concentrated. Um, in fact, Louisiana's emission profile. Uh, is just a little bit different. About 60% of CO2 emissions come from the industrial sector, 25% uh, come from the transportation sector, and only 17% come from the electric sector. So what we recognize is the uh, opportunity 
to, to work and partner with our customers on technologies. And that's where we find the I3 recommendations so helpful um, is recognizing that there is risk associated with first of a kind, second of a kind, nth of a kind sort of technology investments. And uh, at the same time, there is that opportunity to uh, work with our customers uh, on, on technologies that we both need. Uh, for example, many of our customers recognize that electrification of their various energy needs can help them reduce their scope one emissions, uh, their direct emissions, and it actually shifts that from scope one to scope two, an indirect emission by use of electricity. And furthermore, over time, that scope two emission category will drop because of our investments in our portfolio, generation portfolio, and the transition that we're seeing, uh, we've seen over the last 20 years and expect to occur in, in the decades to come. Um, so there's that aspect. But at the same time, many of our customers are setting goals and working on technologies that we need as a company uh, in order to advance our carbon goals, uh, to, to continue that portfolio transformation. And it's some of the technologies we've heard from our other speakers, uh, you know, electrification, of course, but also carbon capture, uh, utilization and sequestration, hydrogen uh, co-firing, um, uh, green and blue hydrogen production and transportation, um, and, uh, uh, you know, renewable natural gas, just to name a few. Uh, all of these technologies are, 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 are some that our customers are working on, and there's this opportunity for a symbiotic relationship between energy providing carbon-free electricity or low-carbon electricity and eventually, hopefully, carbon-free, but at the same time, our customers producing technologies and working together on things that we both need. Uh, to that end, uh, and to sort of think about ways to partner, uh, last year, we launched the, uh, we uh, helped launch the, the Gulf Coast Carbon Collaborative that is off and running this year and doing a lot of great things. Um, and the uh, last thing I'll mention is the increase in um, interest in uh, goals over time, long-term goals, et cetera. Uh, we have a, a 2030 goal. Uh, the state of Louisiana just set a 2050 goal. Uh, and the city of New Orleans, in fact, where we also operate for our corporate headquarters is, has also set a 2040 and a 2050 goal. So, so there's a lot, of, a lot of momentum and the technology that's needed uh, in order for us to continue that portfolio transformation uh, is really the focus, I think, our most important focus of the I3 recommendations. So I look forward to the engagement and thanks again for setting up the session today. Rick, thanks so much. and. Um, uh, now with our turn to our, our final speaker, Anna Dirkswager. Thanks, Brad. Thank you all so much for having the Nature Conservancy here today. As uh, many of you might know, the Nature Conservancy is a global conservation organization and we are dedicated to protecting the land and water on which all life depends. Um, that said, we also know that to mitigate the worst impacts of climate change, we need to reach net zero emissions by 2050. Um, and at the Nature Conservancy, we are fully aware that that path to decarbonization must include policy solutions for the industrial sector. Um, it's interesting, I like that Rick just mentioned the key uh, portion of the portfolio that the industrial sector holds in states like Louisiana, um, the Midwest. It is a major economic driver here in the Midwest. And so sectors like heavy machinery, agricultural production, food production, cement, steel, fertilizer, heavy chemicals, petrochemicals, basic chemicals, pulp and paper, medical and technology production, those are all the key economic drivers in these flyover states. And so when we think about the path to wholesale decarbonization, we are fully aware that it, we have to have solutions that speak to these major economic drivers, and that could not be more important um, than here in the Midwest. Um, at the same time, as Patrice and others have mentioned so far, we're fully aware that the industrial sector accounts roughly for about a third of greenhouse gas emissions. And so we know that decarbonization is going to require some demand side interventions, but that it's also going to require policy solutions that support the investment of innovative technologies and processes that are low carbon. Um, as you all know, and I've sort of become a, a broken record, I think, but 
I think it's really important for conservation organizations to recognize that we can't electrify everything. You all know that, <laughs> but communicating the importance that we have um, greenhouse gas emissions associated with production energy and we have greenhouse gas emissions that are byproducts of chemical processes, those are important distinctions. And so when we look at the path of policy solutions that speak to decarbonization, um, this initiative is one of the reasons that TNC was very excited to lend our voice to this effort because it does speak to moving investments um, that are needed on both the demand side, but also on that innovative technology side. Um, I think that uh, it's, we cannot understate the importance that if we are gonna be realistic in tackling climate change, looking at policy solutions that speak to our wholesale economy are going to be critically important. And this initiative does just that. And so we are excited to support this effort. Great, thanks a lot, Anna. Um, really appreciate all of the speakers. You can tell we have a great group of participants. Um, we have just a few minutes here. Uh, invite anybody to submit questions in the chat box. We do have a question from Neil Elliott. He was pointing out that several of the speakers have talked about the importance of risk uh, as a barrier to innovation and transformation. I suspect that all of the speakers could talk to that, but I wonder in the interest of time and Bo, maybe you could give us a start and see if anyone wants to add anything to that. You may be on mute, Bo. Yeah, just, uh, yeah, uh, I was oh, just there. able to get off mute. Okay. Yeah, certainly um, risk uh, for a startup, I mean, we're a little more advanced than just startup. You know, it comes in a, a variety of forms, but I, I think for us in terms of relating it directly to this conversation, it, it's, it's really mitigating the risk associated with adoption of innovation as it's coming through the process for the people that are you know, charged with actually do, doing the work. So in our case, um, you know, let's use 45Q as a specific example. Um, the thresholds right now, as, as currently stated, um, are not something that the concrete industry is gonna be able to participate in. Um, so because of that, that's gonna create a certain amount of risk associated with adopting the technologies. As we adopt that, or as we hopefully change that policy, the threshold is reduced. You're taking away uh, risk, um, a portion of the risk anyway, not all of it, but a portion of that risk from the, uh, the people actually adopting the technology and driving it into the market. So that's just one example. You know, startups have, we have financial risk, we have all sorts of we have technological risk, we have other things as well. But I think in, in the context of the policy recommendations, it's really about, um, uh, stimulating adoption of the technologies, moving the technologies more rapidly through commercialization. Um, and and a, a key lever of that is to uh, uh, mitigate or minimize smartly the risks associated with adoption. Great. Uh, thanks a lot, Bo. And it looks like, Rick, you just wanted to add something to that. And then there's got, uh, I think, one more question we can take, maybe two, after Rick. Go ahead, Rick. All right, there we go. Hey, uh, yeah, regarding risk, uh, it's a great question. And if you think about it from a utility standpoint, you know, utilities have uh, those underlying principles that, that we also need to focus on of affordability and reliability. You know, reliability is key when it comes to an electric utility, as well as affordability, uh, you know, especially for our low income customers. So we have to balance that along with investing in first of a kind technology. You know, there's been examples where that, that has been done and it has not panned out well uh, just from an implementation standpoint. So the, the risk to us is really, really focuses around needing to balance that reliability, affordability, but also sustainability. Great, thank you, Rick. And let's, I know we're at time, but let's just take one more question uh, it gets, um, and there's a question about, which is really where the rubber meets the road, which is the likelihood of these recommendations moving forward. Uh, direct pay for tax credits and then the 48C tax credit are identified in the question, um, but I think it is, applies more broadly. Does anybody um, maybe um, um, 
Matt, do you want to take a stab at that question? I can maybe add a little bit too on, on direct pay. Maybe you could talk about 48C. Yeah, sure. So, so 48C, um, Representative Boylan um, has already um, has a bill to revive 48C um, that it was also included in the Moving Forward Act. So this was the big infrastructure bill um, that was passed in July in the House of Representatives. Um, you know, uh, we think that that infrastructure bill is great. Um, would love to see that passed. Uh, in the Senate, um, but you know, certainly going forward, it's it's unclear, I guess, for the rest of this Congress whether it's going to be passed. We think it's good policy. We would like to see uh, it move forward in the next Congress if it is not passed in this one. Great, thank you, Matt. And since uh, direct pay was asked about, let me just say very briefly, there's a lot of momentum around direct pay. Uh, and this group has endorsed it uh, for a series of tax credits the Carbon Capture Coalition has for 45Q, uh, the American Wind Energy Association and the Solar Industry, Industry Association and many others have asked for direct pay for their tax credits. Uh, there has been majority legislation from the House Ways and Means Committee introduced in the House. There's a bipartisan bill in the House and we just learned yesterday the major house energy innovation package has an amendment for direct pay as well. Um, the other thing is that there is a movement afoot. We don't know if it'll happen yet to include the title in loan guarantee reforms in the house energy innovation package that's being put together right now. Uh, we'll stay tuned whether that happens, but, but we're hopeful. So we're working wherever we can to ad advance these policies. I'm sorry, there's other questions. Uh, we don't have time. Let me um, just quickly conclude here. If we go to the last slide, I um, want to remind everybody that this, uh, this webinar was recorded. And so we will be getting you a link uh, as well as to those who registered, but were unable to join us. All right, still finishing up this other call. I'll just give me about two more minutes. Uh, Rick, you're on. You're, oh. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. Just, that's all right. Um, so we're just going to keep pushing these economic recovery recommendations for those of you on congressional staff on the on the webinar. We would welcome engaging with you. We're talking to committee staff and member staff working on legislation right now. Nicholas mentioned that we're going to be moving ahead in the coming months, so over the course of this year, next year, to develop a more comprehensive set of state and federal policy and other recommendations. And then finally, we are adding companies, unions, and NGOs to the already great list of I3 participants that we have. Uh, so we appreciate all, so many of you joining us today, and of course our speakers as well. Uh, and we will uh, be coming back to you with further work from the Industrial Innovation Initiative in the future. Thanks again for joining us today. Bye now.